lifted up to God everybody as a sign of absolute surrender. Heavenly Father, once again we have come. We've come from different works of life with different upbringing, cultures, traditions, and experiences. We've come with different needs and burdens, experience and encounters. And if we have ever needed you, it's now. Encounter us. Engage our mind. Engage our spirits. Let yokes break. Let chains fall off. Let burdens be lifted. Let there be illumination. Let there be revelation. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will engage our spirit like never before. In the name of Jesus, let every distraction and interference be arrested in the atmosphere. We unblock treasures. We release increase. We release the growth. We hold back the adversary. We declare we'll never be the same again. Let the word of God have a free course. Let the oil flow. Let angels descend and ascend. Give us a new experience. An encounter like we've never had and known before. Show us the reason for our being. Let none among us here and those online miss the reason for our being. Thank you. In Jesus' name. We want to deal with engaging or fulfilling the responsibilities of the covenant god is the god of covenant and he deals with that based on covenant and i found out that among every other religions in the world it looks like the christian religion is a very relaxed religion and uh, i get very worried about it and i'm concerned about the next generation when i look at other religions and the quantum leaps and the strides they are making and i look at the christian uh, religion, I get very worried because it's one religion that we expect to walk in the privileges and the benefits of the covenant without working the responsibility or the requirement or the terms or demands of the covenant. Now, God is the God of covenant. Come with me, please. Turn your Bible. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 50, Psalm 50 and verse 5. As we begin our journey, the responsibility of the covenant. Gather my sins together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. You see, God is the God of covenant. God is the God of covenant. And there are terms and requirements and privileges and demands and responsibility of every covenant. Two sides of the covenant. God said, you do this and I do that. It's only Christianity that is not a lifestyle. And you watch the Jews, they pray three times a day. The Muslims three, and the defiled ones pray five times a day, constantly. Whether they are broken, they are rich. You go to Dubai at 4.30 in the morning, you see from Rolls Royces, Mercedes, BM, every car you can think of, packed at the mosque at 4.30 in the morning, wealthy people coming to pray at 4.30 in the morning before they go to work. One of my sons went to Abu Dhabi to do business with these guys, and the guy that owned the company was a business sheik. And he called me after the meeting, very, very disturbed about something that happened. The guy just walked in, and all he was doing was this. He held this thing, and he sounded like roses. And he was just doing this. And he didn't say, he didn't see anything. He just sat down, watching them, and they were all talking. The lawyers were talking. He was just doing this. And then he, he placed his hand on the table and said, Gentlemen, thank you very much for doing business with you. And told his lawyers, go ahead, sign the deal. Have a good day. And he walked off. So my son called me and said, Papa, what was that? And I said, that was a spiritual man. He brought his religion and his God and his spirituality to the marketplace. And he exercised dominion over the transaction. And he weighed you and concluded that he can do business with you. Now, the technicalities and the legalities and the rules of engagement is left with the lawyers to handle that. He's finished the deal. He's gone. That is spiritual man. And I said, but you went there and left your God, left your religion, and put behind your spirituality, and you wanted to just be a natural man. But he came there with his religion, unashamedly, not embarrassed, not feeling embarrassed without explaining anything. He brought his religion until we take our religion to the marketplace, until we take our spirituality and our God to everything we do, not only on Sunday morning, we are disadvantaged and others will have an advantage over us. Somebody say, talk to me. 
Now I'm talking to you and you better hear me out. And that is one thing that really moved me about the Prince of Dubai. When you arrive in Dubai, five in the morning, all you hear is their prayers. You hear their prayers everywhere at the airport. The biggest mall in the world is in Dubai. You walk in the malls of Dubai and all you hear is their prayers all over the malls of Dubai. Same thing in their hotels. The tallest building in the world is in Dubai. And they are not ashamed of their religion. They are not ashamed of their God. We are ashamed of our God. We are ashamed of our religion. We apologize for our God. We apologize for our religion. I am not ashamed of my religion. I take it everywhere. I will break any protocol to be who I am. I am what I am by the grace of God. Unashamedly, I announce when I come on the scene, I am a spiritual man. That's who I am. You can't change me. And I will not apologize for my religion. Psalm 50 verse 5. Gather together unto me my saints, my servants, who have established a covenant with me by a sacrifice. There is nothing that works in this life without a sacrifice. It means you pay a price for something. There's nothing. There's nothing you become in this life without paying a price. You pay a price. And I dare you this year to stop taking advantage of things in life. And stop expecting the privileges and the comforts of the covenant, the benefits of the covenant, without carrying out the responsibility. That is one of the problems I have with the freedom of speech. Because some of the freedom of speeches we have in this country has become freedom of insults. But we are people that have respect for the elderly. When we're growing up, when you come from school, and your dad and your mom is seated with friends and family, you begin by greeting everybody. Auntie, uncle, aunties, uncle, dad. And you greet everybody. Then they ask you how was your day and everything before you go to your room. These days, we are raising a generation of kids that when they walk in and they see mom and people talking, they just pass by and say, hi. How was your day? And they walk off. We've left them to television and to African movies to groom them. It is not the responsibility of the schools to groom and to train our children. It's the responsibility of parents. One of the things that is suffering in our society today is marriage. And marriage is suffering because marriage is an institution. And every institution of life, we go to school to be learned, to be taught. If you want to be a doctor, you don't get up and go to theater and cut people if you haven't been taught and educated about medicine. You want to be an attorney. You don't just go around and say, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I represent this individual at the court of law. Hmm? You study law. Then, after studying law, you serve on the masters. Those who have been ahead of you, and they train you, you practice. Before, you then can go to court and represent people. Now, when it comes to marriage, people are not educated and trained. We learn on the job. And so, our sons don't know how to raise and to handle women. They don't know how to love women. They don't even understand the makings of women and the constitutions of women, that women are emotional beings, and they are driven 90% by their emotions and feelings than their reasoning, and 10% inclined to reasoning, but think with two sides of their brain. Wise men are logical beings, and they think 90% inclined to reasoning, but they think with one side of their brains. That's why a woman can be cooking, she's watching television, she's speaking on the phone, she's taking care of the kids, and she's fine. And the man is watching football, the children are fighting and he can't hear it. <laughs> because he thinks with one side of his brain. One of the reasons why they say women don't lie, women lie. But the reason why people think they don't lie is because they don't forget. They remember everything because they are detail-oriented. Wise men are general-oriented. So they will say the same story over and over again. And the man will lie because he has forgotten. So he says something, the woman says, but the other day you said this, oh, okay, 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 okay. Because the man is limited with the way he thinks. <laughs> Come with me, look at the scripture that Jesus quoted that really disturbed me. This scripture, I struggled with it when I was a young preacher. I really did struggle with this scripture. Come with me to Luke 16 and 8. Luke 16 and 8. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. That really troubled me. An unjust steward was commended. Commended. That troubled me as a young preacher. I said, but how can you do that? Jesus. Jesus. How can you commend an unjust 
steward. I don't understand it. Help me. I understand that. I don't understand. I need some help. Jesus, help me. And look at something else he said. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Hmm. Can you believe that? The children of darkness are smarter and wiser than the children of light. I don't get it. It's a contradiction. It's a contradiction for me. What does it mean? It means that the children of light are not using the principles of their kingdom, but the unsaved are using it. It's a true story about something that happened in a village. There was this fetish priest, priestess, and she was fighting with this powerful, powerful juju guy from another village. And the guy and his people pursued this woman, came after her. And I was told that there was this big, you know, hole between where she was and another village that she was trying to jump to. And when she saw it and the depths and everything, she didn't call for Satan. And when she was growing up, she remembered that the Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Whoso what? Ever. Say whosoever. Whosoever means whosoever. So she remembered that scripture. So when she got there with the people chasing her, she screamed, Jesus! And she jumped and she went over. And the next person with his juju and everything, when they got there, he also said something at bosom. He just said some of the things and he fell in the agata. And the woman jumped over. And yes, she doesn't believe in Jesus, oh, but she mentioned the name of Jesus. And she crossed over. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Delivered. Are you hearing me? What am I trying to say here? How many of you have a car? You have a car key. Somebody wave your car key at me. Wave your car key at me. Okay? Wave your car key. All right. Give me your car key. Now, this brother, this is car key. Okay? Now, if I go to the car park right now and I start his car with his key, the car will not tell me, Archbishop, you're a thief. You don't own me. I won't respond. He has to. Why? Because I have the key. When you have a key, you don't knock. You open. Now may you have the keys of life. And may you never knock at any door. From this day, for the rest of your life, may you have the key of life. The key of solution and an answer to every problem in life. Say yes. So, now... I don't believe in the owner of this car. I don't believe in the owner of the key, the car. I don't respect him. I don't care about him. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in him. But I have the key to his car. I will use the key, take the car anywhere I want to, till I'm arrested. Do you know there are a lot of people using keys they shouldn't use in life? On just servants are using keys of the kingdom and it's working for them and the sons and daughters of the kingdom are disadvantaged because you are not using the key may anyone that have your key in their hands relinquish it in the name of Jesus may you live here and recover your keys in the hands of the enemy say yes now may every key that belongs to you and your children in the hands of an enemy be recovered in the name of Jesus. Say yes. You know, if you look at Ecclesiastes, there's a scripture that really bothers me. There are a lot of things that are contradiction for me when I read them because I, I, I struggle with a lot of things because of my background and where I came from. Okay, I struggle with a lot of things because of my own background and where I came from. And... and I realize that serving God is surrender. Because in serving God, it's not just what you understand. It, it, it's faith. And faith don't make sense. And, and there are a lot of things about God that I struggle to make sense out of it. And I've realized that it's a matter of yieldedness and humility. And absolute dependence and reliance on God. And putting aside my own understanding. That's what the Bible says. Be not wise in your own eyes. Lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Somebody say I hear you. There's a scripture in Ecclesiastes that says that I have seen. He said I have seen under the sun. An error that proceeded from the king. And then he said. 
I've seen servants, servants, riding on the back of horses. And I've seen princes walking barefooted on the earth. You know why? You know why? You know why servants are riding on the back of horses? Because they have the key. They have the key. And the princes, because they don't have the key, they are walking barefooted on the earth. May the rules change in your favor. May the principles change in your favor. May any rule and law that gives servants advantage over you be abolished today by light and revelation. And by light, may you see your way through in life. And by faith, may you inherit the promise. Say yes. You know, a professor in Boston was arrested in his house. He was arrested in his own house. Came from work. From, from the University of Harvard. And he didn't have the key to open his own door. And, na and neighbors called the police to arrest him. And the police came and said, sir, uh, what are you doing here? He said, it's my house. And they said, give us a proof. They said, he said, I don't have any identity. Everything is inside. And they said, I'm sorry, you have to come with us. And they arrested him in his own house. You can be arrested in your own house when you don't have the key. And whoever has the key has the advantage. May your keys never be in the wrong hands. May you recover every key in your hands. May your vehicles and your instrument of breakthrough be in your possession and not in the possession of an enemy. Say yes. Now, I give you back your key. How many cars do you have? May you have abundance of cars. And may, may you use it for the benefit of the work of God and humanity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Whoever has your key in their hands, I command a release of the key back into your hands in the name of Jesus. You see? So, that is why life is not fair. Because whoever has that key can access your car and can take it anywhere they want to. And that's why the Muslims are powerful because they are very spiritual people. It doesn't matter how rich or poor they are. When they are in politics, they are in politics with their religion and their God. If you go to Dubai at lunchtime or prayer time with a million dollars or euro pounds to shop, the guy will tell you, I'm sorry. If you can't wait for me to go and finish prayer and come back, then Allah don't want me to have this money. Take your money. They value their prayers, their religion, and their spirituality. A Christian businessman and woman sees a million dollars at prayer time. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the breakthrough. Oh, Father, thou understand. Thou knowest all things. God, you understand. Thank you, Lord. You are a good God. Look at someone as a hypocrite. They will take that million dollars. They won't give anything to God. And they will act like they don't have anything. Something is wrong with us. Let's face it. And you know who will judge us the most? Our children. Our kids are our judges. Because they don't know us by what we say. They know us by the way we live our life. You want to judge me? It's my case. They are my judges. Apart from God. Because they see my lifestyle. And what you see is what you get. What you see me here on Sunday morning is what you get. I am what you see. I'm not an angel. I'm like you. I have vulnerability. I have challenges. But I do my best on daily basis. I strive to get to the mark of the high calling of Christ. Paul said the other day, he said, not as, as one that has attained, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend for which I was apprehended by him that apprehended me. I follow after. I press. I'm struggling with things, but I'm pushing through it. The children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of God. Look at some scriptures with me. Come with me to Mark. Mark chapter 12, verse 17. And Jesus answering said unto them, mm -hmm. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Simple. They tempted him and said, should we pay tax to the government? He said, yes, pay, pay tax to the government. But God also has requirements and demands. So give to Caesar's what is Caesar's. And to God what is God's. So when it comes to giving to God what is God, don't subject it to reasoning and to logic. 
into philosophy. Don't do it. Don't, don't give excuses why you can't give to God what is God and why you should disobey God and ignore God and why you should honor Caesar and you can't honor God and do what God requires of you. You must fulfill the terms of the covenant to qualify and to command and to walk in the benefits and the comforts of the covenant because God is the God of the covenant. He said, if my covenant with the day and the night can be broken, then let my covenant with my servant David be broken. But if my covenant with the day and the night cannot be broken, then my covenant with my servant David can never be broken. What? Uh, an audacity. Are you hearing me, somebody? Ah, Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Uh -huh. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You see? You see? That is Jesus talking. He said, don't be afraid of Caesar. Don't be afraid of the government. And a lot of you are afraid of electricity companies and things because they'll turn off your light. Mm -hmm. So you will obey them, do what is required of them. But when it comes to God's principle, God understands. God doesn't understand why you should ignore him, disobey him, and, and, and handle him anyway, anyhow. And rather respect Caesar and disrespect him. He doesn't understand why you should do that. Because he's almighty. He said, when I commanded the waters in the beginning to gather themselves at one place, and I placed a perpetual decree upon the waters of the earth and called them the sea, and gave the waters of the earth a commandment that they should not proceed any further and must not come to town, and they obey. Where were you? And when I commanded the stars of the heavens to appear in the clouds and in the heavens and to stay there and to do accordingly, where were you? And when I created the little and the greater light, the sun by night and the moon as a reflection of the light by night, where were you? And when I said, let there be light, and the Bible said, and the light shined and appeared in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it, where were you? How dare you subject me to reasoning and to logic and to philosophy? I am a bad reasoning. You can't figure me out. I am God all by myself. I came from nowhere to announce myself that let there be light and I made man in my own image. I can announce myself and defend myself. I am God all by myself. I am Alpha and I am Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. Somebody lift up your hands and shout yes. Look at this scripture, Isaiah 1, 19 and 20. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You see? But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I don't like to emphasize on verse 20. I don't like it. It's in the Bible. But I'm not going to use my mouth to speak it. Read it for yourself. But God said, I want you to escape the 20th verse. Okay? There are, some, there are certain scriptures in the Bible, when I'm preaching, I don't like repeating it. Because I always want to speak blessing over you and not curses. And God said, if you do the 19th verse, if you are willing and obedient, you won't go through the 20th verse. So my mandate is to challenge you and is to encourage you to be willing and obedient. That you eat the good of the land. And God said, it is a requirement. I need you not just to be willing, but I need you to be willing and obedient. And I need you not just to be obedient, but I want you to be obedient and willing. It goes hand in hand. You say, are you the good of the land? I don't believe in this. No, there's no money. There's no money. There's no money. Where's the money? Who has it? Somebody has it. You think it's everybody that is struggling in this country? No. There are, very, there are people who are very comfortable in this country. There are people who are very comfortable in life. There are certain people who see that they budget, uh, you know, how much they should spend for salt, for pepper, for onions, for tomatoes, and for this. There are other people, they don't budget anything. They just leave. Today, I release you to leave. I release you from budgeting to abundance. Say yes. Job 36, 11 and 12. Job 36, 11 and 12. Look if they it. obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Uh -huh. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. God is saying, if you do verse 11, you can avoid verse 12. And verse 11 is simple. He said, if you will serve me and obey me, you will live your days in prosperity and your years in pleasures. I love that one. Oh. 
I like that one and I love it. And I command it to manifest in your life. I command you to obey and to serve him that you may live your days this year in prosperity and your years in pleasures. For it is in you. I live and move and have my beings. Hence what I will take you to the marketplace. You will be in my life everywhere. I will serve you Lord. And when my days are over, I will check out with satisfaction and a sense of gratitude because I saved you well. Amen.